Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, so what, what is a Newton polytope? I mean, first, I mean, what is even a polytope? But okay, let's do Newton polytope first. Um, the question asks us to use this polynomial f, um, and that's too intimidating. So the first step in any problem, uh, step one, um, if, is find <laughs> find a simpler problem to solve. So above we had f equals stuff with x's, y's, and z's, but that's too much. So let's just try if f is the polynomial um, x squared plus 7. I'm just going to do one variable, just um, one variable, because that's that's got to be simpler. Um, x minus 17x to the 8th. Okay. So in one variable, I, I go to the real number line, and let's say this is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Um, the Newton, poly okay, Newton polytope is going to look at these exponents. That's the, I just circled an invisible 1, and then this is an 8. And it's just going to put a dot at the at these exponents. Oh, wait, this is a 1. Uh, OK. And this is an 8. 5, 6, 7, 8. OK, so the Newton polytope, Newton polytope equals the convex whole of the exponent vectors. Okay, so in only one variable, there's only one exponent on each term. And so one term, two terms, three terms, this is this polynomial is the sum of three terms. And so I have one, two, three points. And the convex whole of them is just this line segment here. Okay, now let's do... Okay, I said find a simpler problem to solve, but I hadn't even told you what a Newton polytope is, so I don't expect that you would do this. I guess really what I mean is when I'm trying to explain something, I should find a simpler thing to explain first. So now let's, let's step up um, a level and let's put f in two variables. Two variables. So let's say f is x to the third y minus 5 plus um, xy squared. So the Newton polytope is the convex whole of the exponent vectors. And so this term has the exponent vector 3 comma 1. This term has the exponent vector of 0 comma 0. And this term has the exponent vector of 1 comma 2. Now I think you know what exponent vectors is better than when we just looked at the one-dimensional case. Sometimes the two-dimensional case is the easiest. Um, but anyway, so let's let's visualize this. 0, 0 is here. 3, 1 is here. And 1, 2 is here. So now what's the Newton polytope? It is the convex whole of those three points. So the Newton polytope is this triangle. Newton polytope of F. Okay. Um, okay, let's let's do uh, another. Well, let's do the real one. Luckily, I already did it. Okay, so here we have. Um, so this term in our polynomial f, this is from the actual problem 2, has the exponent vector 5, 2, 1. This term has the exponent vector 4, 3, 0. Um, notice, notice that um, the Newton polytope completely ignores the coefficients. So like this minus sign 
and this plus sign are the same from the Newton polytopes point of view because it doesn't even pay attention to them. Um, similarly, like it ignored this five uh, and this one and this one. Okay, I could, you know, I've put a three there and this is the same Newton polytope. I could put a 300 there and it's the same Newton polytope. So it ignores the coefficients. And um, in this case, this polynomial had, I guess, nine terms. That's the word term is important. Uh, it's a thing that we're adding. So the terms of a sum. That's versus the word factor. A factor is a thing we're multiplying. The factors of a product. Factor of a product. Term of a sum. Um, it's funny, I, I used to think that these words are silly. They're incredibly useful. Um, okay, and then the convex hull of these things is this three-dimensional object here that I really couldn't draw, and I don't even know really what it looks like. Like, should there be a crease there? Um, you know, how many vertices does it have? How many edges does it have? How many faces, two-dimensional faces, does it have? How many three-dimensional faces does it have? Okay, that one I know. That one is one. How many four-dimensional faces do it? does it have? Zero. And so all the rest are zero. It doesn't have any higher-dimensional faces. But I don't know, how many two-dimensional faces does it have? Like, at least three, I don't know, maybe five? I would... It's... In other words, I sort of gave you an impossible problem, so I apologize for that. Um, you'd really need a computer program, or else just spend way more time than I have trying to figure out exactly how many faces this convex hole. And I'll, I'll write that down, Con convex hole. Um, you should look at the Wikipedia page for this. Um, but, yeah, okay, so... This is the Newton polytope. Now, why on earth would we ever look at this thing? Well, okay. It turns out that solving polynomial equations is incredibly hard. You might have thought it's easy because sort of all my math teachers in the past pretended it was easy. Um, basically until I was done with graduate school, honestly. Finally then, after that, somebody told me, like, hey, it's okay you can't solve these because they're really hard. Now, to find the solutions, it turns out that the volume of this polytope has to do with the number of solutions. And when you have m multiple equations, multiple polynomials, like if you had two polynomials, then you take something called the mixed volume of this polytope and the similar polytope for the other um, for the other uh, polynomial, whatever it looks like. And so we're going to talk about that later. Um, yeah, so like the the area of this triangle has something to do with uh, solutions to equations. So let's go look at this book. This is called Huygens, Barrow, Newton, and Hook. And this part is about mathematical analysis. So, okay, let's, I'm just going to read this. You can, I don't know if this is an effective way to do this, but Newton remarked the laws of nature are expressed by the differential equations he devised. Individual and at times very important differential equations had been considered and solved even earlier. But ne Newton turned them into an independent and very powerful instrument discovered a way of solving any equations, not only differential, but for example, algebraic, like the ones we have with polynomials. He regarded this discovery as his most important achievement and codified it in a letter uh, to Leibniz on this day. It was sent via this other person, um, the second letter to Oldenburg, okay, in which he described analysis. Analysis is a concept that's quite difficult to define. Newton understood by analysis the investigation of equations by means of infinite series. In other words, Newton's basic discovery was that everything had to be expanded in infinite series. Therefore, when he had to solve an equation, whether a differential equation or a relation defining some unknown function, this is now known as the implicit function theorem, Newton proceeded as follows. All functions are expanded in power series. 
the series are substituted into one another, the coefficients of identical powers are compared, and one by one the coefficients of the unknown function are found, the coefficients of its power series expansion. The theorem about the existence and uniqueness of solutions of differential equations is proved in this way instantaneously, together with the theorem about dependence on the initial conditions, so long as we're not worried about convergence of the resulting series. As for convergence, these series converge so rapidly that Newton, although he did not strictly prove convergence, had no doubts about it. He had the definition of convergence and explicitly calculated series for specific examples with an enormous number of digits. In the letter to Leibniz, Newton wrote that he was ashamed to admit to how many digits he took these calculations. So this is nice because this shows you that the most important thing is examples and computation of examples. And that is how you learn. You don't learn from definitions. Um, you learn from examples. That's just a human thing. Uh, well, it's human because the definitions were invented. That word that you're defining in a math book is invented because there were enough examples to justify it. Um, so the first thing is to compute examples. Okay, he remarked that his series converged like a geometric progression, so there's no doubts about the convergence of his series. Following his teacher Barrow, Newton realized that analysis has a justification, but quite reasonably he did not think it useful to linger on it. One could extend it by an apagogical, I don't know what this is, argument, wrote Barrow, but to what purpose? The Newton polygon. So let's, here's a Newton polygon, the Newton polygon. Apart from power series in which solutions of differential equations are expanded, Newton also used fractional powers, which are used when one needs to find an expansion for an algebraic function defined by an equation like some polynomial in x and y equals zero. Um, suppose, for example, that we need to solve the algebraic equation here. So let's look at that one. Uh, this has x and y, so we're going to be in the plane. It has a 2, 0. That's a 2, comma 0. This is a 0, comma 3. This is a 1, comma 2. And this is a 7, comma 0. So here's my 7, 0. Maybe my 1, 2 is there. Uh, the 2, 0 is here. And the 0, 3 is there. Okay, this is a bad drawing because I think that Okay, so then here's the Newton polygon. Notice that this point, this was the point um, 1, 2 that I very badly drew, uh, is inside the convex hole of the other three. So actually what will happen is, um, is that this, this term of the series, or sorry, of the polynomial, uh, namely this one right here, is going to be sort of less important than the others. It's it's an amazing fact that sort of only the sides of this um, poly, polygon, so polygon is, is the word for polytope in two dimensions, polytope in two dimension, whereas polytope, it can be in any dimension. And polytope, you can find a very nice Wikipedia article. Um, okay. So then, says Newton, we need to make the following transformation. Similar transformations are now called Fourier transformations, but in the given case, they are nevertheless Newton transformations. We cease to regard a polynomial as a function of the variables x and y, and consider it as a function on the integer lattice in the plane. This is a very interesting thing. Take some time, like, pause the video, think about this statement. Um, yeah. Okay, welcome back from your pausing of the video. At a point with coordinates mn, this function takes a value equal to the coefficient of x to the m, y to the n in the polynomial. So there's where the coefficient of this monomial comes in. It's the value of the function. We now mark on the lattice, a lattice, um, in this case, is like z2 inside of r2. 
We now mark on the lattice the points corresponding to monomials with non-zero coefficients and take their convex whole. We obtain the Newton polygon, figure 7. This is it. So 1, 2, 3, 4 terms were in our polynomial, and um, this is their, the Newton polytope. It turns out that the monomials corresponding to vertices inside the polygon, in, so vertices inside the polygon, <laughs> so uh, in other words, this one, uh, it's inside the polygon, have no influence on the form of the series. So we can forget about them, and we need only consider the sides. For example, the side AB in figure 7 corresponds to the two-term equation, like this, we just forget about the other terms. Because if we go to, a, to side AB, um, like that side, there's only two terms. And so we just forget about the others and we deal with that one. Solving this equation and neglecting everything else, we find y as a function of x. This function gives a good approximation near the origin to the solution of our equation. Approximation to the solution. It's not the solution. Right, we threw away two terms, completely ignored them. If we wish to find the next approximation, we need to write this and substitute it into the original equation. After the substitution, we again obtain an algebraic equation, but now for z, which we need to deal with in exactly the same way. Iterating this process, we obtain a series in fractional powers. It is now called the Pissot series, which gives the solution y of x of the equation in a neighborhood of the origin. This method always works. If we had started with another side of the polygon, we would have arrived at another series, which corresponds to another branch of the algebraic function. The side bd in figure 7 corresponds to the asymptotic behavior at infinity. Okay, so let me just tell you that I would love to understand this, but everything here is uh, actually, I don't understand this yet. I haven't spent the time with it. I haven't tried to figure it out, um, but this is something we could do if we're interested. It's not really in the plan for this class, um, but I wanted to... Um, say what's a Newton polytope and why would we care about it. And this is sort of a completely different direction we could go in in discovering things in math. And I'm going to plan to go in a different direction um, where I use the Newton, Newton polytope um, in other ways that are very useful. But it's just there's even more that I actually don't know about. So I thought I'd just let you know that... You don't have to know everything. Well, you certainly don't have to know everything. Um, nobody does. Okay, well, I thought this was interesting. So this book is, what is this book? Yeah, um, Huygens and Barrow, Newton and Hook. Very interesting book. I'll check if the library has it.